Good morning and welcome to Kingston Congregational Church. My name is Joanne Piller and I am the Deacon of the Month. Whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We have a few announcements this morning. A reminder of our fall congregational uh, meeting today after our service at 1045. The information was sent out earlier in the KCC Weekly News. The Women's Fellowship, there will be a special Zoom gathering for Women's Fellowship on Monday night, October 19th, tomorrow on Zoom starting at 7 o'clock p.m. Please join us and say hello. The Board of Christian Ed has two announcements. They are happy to be hosting our third annual Trunk or Treat event on Friday, October 30th with a food drive for the Johnny Cake Center. Please pre-register to either decorate your trunk or register your family for trunk, trunk or treating. And the kids are welcome to bring a friend. E event links are on the church newsletter and Facebook. Um, there's a reminder that um, we're still looking for adults to decorate the trunks or provide candy on, on this date at October 30th at 5 o'clock. And also on Mondays in November, starting November 2nd, our adult book group will be discussing a book by UCC pastor Lillian Daniels in Zoom meetings from 7 to 8 p.m. The group will explore the Pew research on religion in America and the growing number of adults who do not identify with any one religion. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. It's good to have you with us today or whenever you join us for this worship service. We're delighted to have you and have you participating in this live stream service on the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome one and all. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 90. I'm, I'm not going to read the entire psalm. I encourage you to do that. It's really an appropriate psalm for these pandemic days. It's a psalm about God's eternity and human frailty. I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 90 as our call to worship. <clears throat> Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So teach us to number our days, to count our days, that we may grow wise in our hearts. Turn, O Lord, how long have compassion upon your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your works be made manifest, made known to us, and your glorious power to our children and our children's children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper, O oh God, the work of our hands. May God be with us as we worship this day. Our opening hymn is number 26 in the New Century Hymnal, verses 1, 2, and 4. We worship you, O oh God. The words are embedded in the program available online. But we worship you, O oh God, number 26, verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> me for the invocation in the Lord's Prayer. Eternal God, known by many names through the ages, worshipped in many ways by myriads of people through countless generations, open our minds and hearts to the, to the movement of your spirit in these challenging and contentious days. Through scripture and song, word and witness, prayer and offering, Renew us now and every day for your glory and renew us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray and continue to pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for God, now and forever. Amen. morning, everyone. Today's word for all ages is fruit. And I know, I talk about food so much, you guys would think that I'm here promoting fellowship all the time, but I just love food. <laughs> I used to work for a celebrity chef, uh, and he taught me so many healthy and delicious fresh recipes that now I love to cook, especially for other people. And so I love today's lesson. It's called the fruits of the spirit. And it is meant to teach us that God has a recipe for our lives. He wants us to live by the fruit of the Spirit so that other people will know that by our actions that we love Jesus and all of God's children. So, what is a recipe? It's something we use when we cook. The directions in the recipe help us to take different ingredients and foods and combine them to create something new and delicious. The fruits of the Spirit are God's recipe for living a life that celebrates God. And when people see the fruits of the Spirit, they see that we are different. They don't see selfishness or anger or bitterness, but they see, these are the ingredients, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Well, that sounds like a recipe for a happy life, doesn't it? <laughs> We're going to practice that in church school outside. We're going to try to memorize some of those um, later this morning. But let's uh, ask God how we can, how God can show us how we can add these fruits to our lives every day. And I'll close with a prayer. Dear God, teach us to live by the fruits of the Spirit so people will see Jesus in our lives. Amen. The scripture readings on the first one is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, beginning with verse 13 and concluding with verse 26. It is a list of vices and virtues, something very common in the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day. Lists of the things that are not good for us and lists of things that are good for us. So here's what Paul wrote to the Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves, servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, 
I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now listen to this, Paul says, there is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn from the New Century Hymnal is number 571. O God of love, O God of peace. All verses, 571. Please join with me in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For in Christ Jesus, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's hard to believe that it's been over seven months now since this pandemic entered our lives and affected our lives in such dramatic ways. And no doubt you have been reflecting a lot on these past seven plus months about all that we have been through, all that has happened, all that we have experienced. And yes, we are infuriated by our contentious and inconsistent response to this pandemic and the needless suffering that has resulted from it. But on the other hand, we are inspired by the commitment and cooperation of so many people around the world. But first, I'd like to begin with my infuri infuriations. I'd like to be like uh, Frank uh, Costanza on Seinfeld, who invented a holiday called Festivus, where you could just get it all out and complain to people and tell them what you really think. So I'm going to be in a Festivus mood right now. Here we go. So let's start with the negatives. This is my list, and you better pay attention to it. Why was our response so poor and why was it so poor when there is so much research 
There has been so much planning and preparation. That was already in place prior to this pandemic. Why were there the alarming calls of public health specialists and national security specialists and disaster specialists, even people experts who had gained these things out, why were their alarms not heeded? Why were their warnings ignored? Why do we devalue and distrust and even demean experts? Why do we allow people we know and love to demean experts? And to say, well, that's just one opinion. Theirs was not a hit or miss forecast, like a snowstorm. You know that foot, one foot snowstorm that's coming, that nor'easter that's coming, and then it goes out to sea and we only get a couple of inches, and we're all very angry with the meteorologists, aren't we? But these folks were, were predicting, uh, not predicting anything, they were giving us Due warning of imminent danger, a tsunami was coming. A tsunami, a novel virus epidemic in China. And it was coming in our direction, not only from China, but through the back door from Europe. They warned us. They told us. We knew it was coming. We have seen people crowding bars and clubs and beaches and we pull our hair out and say, what's wrong with these people doing such foolish things as this? Why have people defied public health experts and public health best practices to have large gatherings from rallies to weddings, such as the wedding that we saw recently in Maine that ended up causing the death of any number of folks in that area and causing illness to many more? Why have obstinate, obnoxious people refused to cooperate and even become combative in stores and other public places? Why have they acted that way? And why have they felt that they could put all of us at risk just because they don't want to wear a mask? Why do people still complain that the whole thing is just exaggerated by the media? Why do people dismiss COVID-19 as, quote-unquote, no worse than the flu, when it is so, more, so much more dangerous right now and much deadlier than the flu? Why do people see this as a threat to their liberty and equate mask wearing with slavery, the ultimate insult to anyone who has ancestry that were, uh, ancestors and people in their history who were enslaved? What an insult to them to say that wearing a mask is the equivalent of slavery. What an insult. What an insult to humanity to compare that with slavery. Why do people claim that this is a, a left-wing, deep state plot to undermine the president? Why do armed individuals intimidate public officials and go into state houses and even threaten to kidnap our governors? Why do we falsely separate public health from the economy when they are so integrally related? Why? 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 So I have done my Frank Costanza this morning. I've gotten my Festivus complaints off of my chest. These are all infuriating. And sure, there are many more. But I'm also inspired. Here's why. And here's a, here's a starter list for, for at least my list, and for, I'm sure you have your list as well. Well, here's my list of positives. First of all, the Asian nations. Many of them res responded quickly, decisively, and heroically. They have been through epidemics before. I always wondered why folks from Asia wear masks in public. Who knew? They knew something that we didn't know, right? I admire their, their quick response, their decisive response, their heroic response. They've been through this before and they know what to do. Not only the experts, but the people in those populations know what to do. And in the aftermath of this pandemic, we have a lot to learn from them, don't we? And so I pray that from this day forward, America first will mean something different. It will mean that we will be first in line 
to humbly learn from others. We will be first in line to learn from the experience and expertise of others. People who have been through this before, who have handled this before, who know how to live through this, and who have a sense of the collective responsibility that we have for each other. Healthcare workers inspire me globally and locally as they continue to risk their lives for the sick and the dying, COVID-19 patients as well as other patients. I'm inspired by the people that have been cheering for them and singing to them and doing all sorts of wonderful things for them. And that beautiful story that came out some weeks ago about that factory in Pennsylvania where the workers would not go home until they had made enough personal protective equipment to supply the medical profession. They stayed in the factory, they slept in the factory, they worked hard week after week after week producing PPE. I'm inspired by the brilliance, the commitment, the clarity, and the honesty of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who seems to never get flustered. He just keeps going in the straight direction of fact and evidence, and the evidence of science, and his honesty, and his clear-sightedness, and his many colleagues around the world, they all inspire me. The hospitals and first responders prepared to serve us at the very, to the very best of their ability at great personal risk. They inspire me, as do the people that bring the packages to my door, as do the people who work in the grocery stores and all sorts of other essential places of service who provide for us. I am inspired by clear-eyed, laser-focused, truthful, hopeful, well-informed political leaders. They have inspired me from day one of this pandemic. Honest, well-informed, science-based state governors have been, for me, the Winston Churchills of our darkest hour, telling us the truth and reassuring us through these difficult days. Clear-sightedness, laser-focused, honest, straightforward, not trying to protect us like little children, but giving us the facts. If this pandemic has made anything clear to us, it is the importance of good government. Good government. People in civil service who have, d d d they have dedicated their lives to serving us and helping us live a better life. That's what we mean when we say government. Good government is very important. Honest leadership, evidence-based policies, and ultimately a cooperative citizenry. Nothing less will do. We need facts, not fantasies, and we need facts and not fantasies to survive and eventually defeat this pandemic. That's what we need, facts. The everyday kindness of people inspire me. Everyday kindness. Family members and friends near and far have reached out to my wife and myself to check in with us. People in our Providence neighborhood where we recently moved, um, recently moved out of that neighborhood, people throughout this pandemic would come by our house and say, oh, what a nice house, or what a lovely garden, or how about those Red Sox? Well, we won't talk about that, but nevertheless, they saw my sweatshirt. I'm still mad about Mookie Betts, I'm sorry. People in our new Baltimore neighborhood, where I was just these last three days, they have already come over to welcome us, including one gentleman who brought a very nice bottle of Italian wine. Thank you very much. We really appreciated that. All of that inspires me. All of it. People helping us, assuring us, serving us, working for us, protecting us, keeping us well informed. So many good people doing their best. That's what inspires me. And I'm sure you have your list as well. So yes, in the spirit of Festivus, you can make your list of grumbling and complaints and so on and just have it out if you want. But seriously, anger is a virtue. Healthy anger is a virtue, not rage, not kind of passive aggression or just stuffing it inside. No, healthy anger is a virtue. It is cathartic. It is empowering. It moves us from carping and complaining towards a constructive and focused action 
Let people in power know how you feel constructively, and you need not bring your AR-15 with you when you do it. You don't need to yell and shout in their faces. You need to be angry in a constructive way that creates good movement and good action for the benefit of all. Speak truth to power when people are not being well served, when the sick are not receiving the care they need, and when their care caregivers do not have the supplies that they need, not only to care for those who are sick, but to protect themselves. Speak truth to power. Vote out those who have failed us. Tune out deniers and conspiracy theorists and encourage others to do the same. And even more, challenge yourself and challenge everyone you know and love to get the facts. I was talking with a family member who was just so frustrated by another, uh, another family member who was just spewing all of these things and how terrible this was and so on and so forth. And I told this a loved one, I said, make a deal with this relative and say, wait three days before you pass it on on social media. Get the facts before you spread a social virus. Get the facts first. Wait, wait, just pause, hit the pause button and just seek out what is true as much as possible. Please note, and I hope you have noted, noticed this, that I have listed as many positives and inspirations as I have negatives and infuriations. Why? Because I am an ever hopeful 50.01 percenter. You know, it's, it's close sometimes, but I would rather see the world as a glass just ever so slightly half full as opposed to half empty. The glass is always half full because time and time again, character and truth eventually triumph over hubris and denial. Trust and hope eventually triumph over fear and doubt. No virus pandemic, no viral attitudes can overcome us, not when we live out our virtues together and individually. And so that's why we need Right now, a virtue vaccine. That's what we need. There is no need for clinical trials because we know that these human virtues have been efficacious. They have been effective. They have been curative for thousands of years. We know that. Paul's letter to the Galatians was written almost 2,000 years ago. Human nature is human nature. We know that virtues work. And it's about time that we inoculated ourselves with them. Without, a, without question, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to challenge us at every level of life. I don't need to uh, list all of the ways that it has challenged us. We all know that very well. My heart breaks, especially for young people whose recitals and graduations and vacations and other celebrations and, and, and sports events and other meaningful things for them have been lost. I, I grieve for them and for so many other things. But in a crisis like this one, when people are so worried and so pressured, so anxious and feeling so vulnerable, challenging attitudes and difficult behaviors have emerged, sadly. How many of us remember back on 9-11? Those of us who were living in Rhode Island at the time, we witnessed hateful attacks. Now, this happened all over the country, actually. People uh, attacking uh, anyone who looked Arab or Muslim. Do you remember that, that unfortunate Sikh man who was an engineer in Virginia who was pulled off the train at the Providence Station because people thought he was a terrorist? And they yelled at him. They spat upon him as he was carried away off the train. How horrible is that? And now in recent weeks and months, we have seen people lash out or avoid Chinese Americans because, you know, it's their fault that we have this virus. Or anyone who looks Chinese, well, we blame them. and We don't want anything to do with them. Crises like this one, they, they fray and, and they tear at our social fabric. 
just as this novel virus attacks people weakened by age and pre-existing conditions of one kind or another, it also attacks societies weakened by ideological warfare, by political partisanship, by income inequality, by selfishness, and all kinds of social unrest. A pandemic exposes all of these weaknesses that we have as a society. In our case, we are weakened also by the balkanization of America into red states and blue states, into media, media echo chambers. And I would even add that not only do we have social distancing, which is very important, but something we also have is partisan distancing. I want nothing to do with anybody who disagrees with me. And so we just push them away instead of working on civil dialogue. These are some of the vices that COVID-19, pandem the pandemic feeds on, not so much the sexy sins like lust, but the so-called vices that weaken us and as a society. Paul listed them so effectively in Galatians. They're almost like proverbial nails in our society's coffin. Hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, self-ambition, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy. These are the things these are the social viruses that will eventually kill us as a society if we don't take our virtues seriously. While the epidemiologists try to get ahead of the pandemic and to map it out and deploy resources, and while the infectious disease researchers work diligently to develop a vaccine, and while healthcare workers do their best to treat COVID-19 patients and others, and while civil servants at every level of our government seek to bring order out of chaos, we would do well to ask this question. What can we do? What can we do? We can inoculate ourselves, inoculate ourselves from these and other social viruses that attack us in our weakest places, exploit our vulnerabilities and compromise our best selves. What can we do? we can practice our virtues. Combating the social and spiritual viruses of any crisis starts with, with me. It starts right here with me and with you. If I manage my own anxiety, guess what? The people around me might just become less anxious. If I manage my attitudes and think, uh, think about others with grace, Maybe others will as well. If I seek factual information and speak truth to power, maybe others will as well. Compassion is contagious. Charity is contagious. Courage is contagious. Clarity is contagious. Commitment is contagious. Collaboration is contagious. Christ-likeness is contagious. This is what we need now and lots of it. We need these virtues to combat destructive social and spiritual viruses, the ones that are attacking us every single day. The Beatitudes are so important. They are a veritable foundation for us at a time like this. The virtues we need to strengthen and maintain ourselves are found in these Beatitudes that Jesus gave from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually open, for they will lead us to God's beloved community. Blessed are those who mourn, those who engage and embrace sorrow as a part of life, for they will be strengthened. Blessed are the meek, that is, the humble, not the, not the weak or the passive, but the humble, those who have a true estimate of themselves, for they will lead us towards global community. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they seek to be at one with God's just purposes and they will be fulfilled eventually. Blessed are the merciful for they will increase mercy in return. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who are sincere and transparent. Boy, do we need that these days, sincerity and transparency, for they will see God and God will be seen in them. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who make peace for others will come to see God in them and through them. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, who sacrifice and suffer for God's just peace, because they will dwell in God's beloved community. These are virtues we need. And to that we add Paul's fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With these virtues, we can overcome anything. No distancing needed there. Spread it around as much as you can. And that, my friends, is what is called spiritual herd immunity when we spread such virtues around. Dear siblings in Christ and dear people of goodwill, we are all in this for the long haul. We're in this for the long haul, for the days and years to come. Without diminishing the enormous challenge we face with COVID-19 and without diminishing the physical threat of this virus for so many people, I am convinced that the social and spiritual virtues we espouse and practice will carry us through to the other side of this pandemic. We will be better for the, having had this experience. We will learn from this experience. We will grow from this experience. And the health and well-being of our society counts on us learning from this experience. May God's grace, peace, and strength be with us. And may God grant us the wisdom and the courage we need for the facing of this hour and for the living of these days. May God help all of us. And would you join with me now as we offer the prayer of St. Francis as a prayer that I think is, is one that just really speaks to us in this moment. So please pray with me. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us bring love. Where there is offense, let us bring pardon. Where there is discord, let us bring union. Where there is error, let us bring truth. Where there is doubt, let us bring faith. Where there is despair, let us bring hope. Where there is darkness, let us bring your light. Where there is sadness, let us bring joy. O Master, let us not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in self-forgetting that we find, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are raised to eternal life. Amen. Members and friends of Kingston Congregational Church, this is an exciting time, even in spite of this pandemic. This is an exciting time. Your new pastor will be here in two weeks, uh, and we celebrate her uh, calling to this church, Jan, Pastor Jan's calling, and we look forward to her beginning her service as she leads worship on November the 1st. And I mention that because the uh, support of this congregation is so critical at a time such as this, and we continue to do our best to provide ministries and services for all who uh, are related to this church and any who have need. And we pray that you will continue to remember this church in your prayers and also through your offerings. So we invite you to please re remember to support Kingston Congregational Church in your giving and also in your prayers. And so now having uh, received the call to the offering, let us now pray together the offertory prayer. Lord of life and love, we pray, for all who bring your word of grace to comfort the afflicted, for all who bring your word of truth to afflict the comfortable, for all who bring your word of hope to call us to a higher purpose. May the grace and peace of Christ be heard in the clarity and truthfulness of our words, be seen in the compassion and courage of our deeds, 
and be known in the humility and integrity of our lives. Receive our offerings of spirit and substance this day and always. For the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Now Thank We All Our God, and I'd like to just say a word about that hymn, if I could, before we start. It's 419 in your hymnal. If you have a hymnal, it's embedded in the service online. Uh, we often associate this hymn uh, by Martin Rinkert uh, with Thanksgiving, which is, uh, it's traditionally sung at Thanksgiving time, Now Thank We All Our God. However, Martin Rinkert, Rinkert was a Lutheran minister during the Thirty Years' War, and he had to bury, as a pastor, because the other pastors in his community had died, had to bury several thousand people in one year alone in the midst of, an, of a plague. This hymn came out of his experience in a plague. So it very much relates to the pandemic, this whole experience that we're passing through. So other folks have suffered and other folks have found faith and found a way to go forward and found a way to give thanks. Martin Rinkert was one of them. So as we sing these words, be mindful of those who have struggled in days past, even as we struggle in our own time. that we went right past our um, moment uh, that we have for prayers for the people. So prior to the benediction, I'd like to jo invite Joanne to come forward to share her uh, prayer concerns and celebrations. Thank you. Prayers and, con and celebrations of the people. We continue to hold in our prayers those affected by natural disasters and those strong, brave men and women working to protect them. We pray for those suffering from the many diagnoses, illnesses, and diseases, and the many strong, brave men and women who are responsible for their care. We also pray that our country can heal and find positive, peaceful solutions to unite and bring us together. In celebrations, I noticed that Pam Lyons just celebrated a birthday this week. My brother Mike celebrates his 60th birthday this week, and I actually have a birthday this week too. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. 
And I also apologize to Enrico because uh, he had prepared a, a sermon response, which we didn't hear because I was just so wrapped up in my Festivus <laughs> that I just went right, right by it. And uh, here we are, but I know that you're a gracious people and that uh, I'll never do that again. So uh, thank you, and thank you, Joanna. And uh, once again, just continued prayers for Pastor Jan as she uh, makes her transition now uh, into this area and moves with her family to begin her ministry with you in two weeks. And I certainly celebrate uh, the opportunity to be of service to you at this time, and thank you for that opportunity. And uh, after a brief break, uh, we will begin our uh, October or fall meeting, church meeting. I'm going to uh, suggest that we bump it up to maybe 1040. Uh, just, you know, give about 15, 20 minutes in between this, the end of this service and the beginning of the meeting. So look for the meeting to, to begin at about 1040 because we are ending uh, ahead of the uh, half hour here. So with all of that, now let us hear the words of the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all now and always. Go in peace and may God's peace go with us always. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.